Unlike Starship Troopers, which takes a humorous look at how a fascist regime like this maintains power, V deconstructs the consequences of severing such a savage and stately stranglehold on a civilian population. Remember, remember the 5th of November. England has been turned into a prison. Through a series of devastating events, the entire country has been closed off from the world. Quarantines, strict borders, ostracizing of immigrants and homosexuals, the government stranglehold on England has lasted so long and so intensely that its population has become pacified. The complacent keep their heads down. There is no end in sight. The people of this Orwellian nightmare have lost hope. They would cry out for a hero if they could only remember what those are. V goes for a walk through the streets on his way to his first staging of the revolution. He meets Evie and saves her from the Fingermen. Evie is being attacked and she is incapable of defending herself. After witnessing the destruction of the Old Bailey at the hands of this terrorist, Evie has her perspective slightly tweaked. This is perhaps the first time she has witnessed true defiance and it piques her long dormant curiosity. The next day, V goes to the TV station where Evie works. Since the government is divided into body parts, the fingermen being the hands, the TV studio is the mouth, spouting its prepackaged propaganda to the petrified public. V then goes on TV, the opiate of the masses. V's TV speech is laced with Aristotelian themes and some from the German philosopher Immanuel Kant who believed that perpetual peace could be secured through universal democracy and international cooperation. His hope was to remind the world that fairness, justice, and freedom are more than words. They are perspectives. We can learn a good deal about how fragile the balance of power can be by how V disposes of his former captors. He starts by silencing the voice of the regime, Louis Prothero. Prothero is in his shower, echoing his own hate speech to delight and in love with the sound of his own voice. And just like that, his power, or rather his illusion of his power, is gone, and he defaults to the sniveling little weasel that he is, crawling and begging. When when he kills Dr. Surridge, unlike her male accomplices, she faces her death evenly, but with an obvious fear. She knows exactly what she did to V. She essentially killed him and witnessed his rebirth. It goes all the way to Sutler, a man so vile and riddled with rancor that he's not even worth the effort. V has Mr. Creedy do it, and for self-serving reasons. Then there's Creedy himself, a disgusting figure with only hate. V kills him in a primal way, satisfyingly simple, and the life just goes out of his eyes. V is a transcendent character, and like any revolutionary, he holds up a mirror to the oppressed and the unconsciously oppressed. But V is not the hero of this story. Pounded into an intense sense of complacency, Evie Hammond has learned to keep her head down. Burying her unprocessed grief for the loss of her family, she coasts through her life, wanting to not be noticed by the wrong people. She is petrified, as victims of severe trauma are, of the ones who hurt her. Evie unfortunately lives in a world where the creed of, don't draw attention to yourself or something bad will happen, reigns supreme. By way of V's abduction of Evie, her external prison is actually removed. In the safe haven of the Shadow Gallery, Evie is, in a way, safer than she ever has been. But because V's illusion is so convincing, Evie can now focus on vanquishing her very rooted fear of her potential. When V captures Evie and puts her into the fake prison, the case can certainly be made for the severity of his cruelty. V is revisiting the vile harm onto Evie that was shown to him. But even with the intensity of the torture, it is but a sliver of with the so-called scientists subjected onto V. Listen to me, Evie. <laughs> this may be the most important moment of your life. Come into it. Evie is beaten, tortured, tormented, and threatened. Nevertheless, she persisted. She refused to give that itch. Even if the threat was not real, her perspective was real enough for her. Her own father said artists use lies to tell the truth. Evie is brought to the breaking point, ready to succumb to despair, until she receives a letter from a stranger and a gift. Her understandable reaction to being subjected to V's farce is Evie at her most basic, almost primal stage. Her complacency was leveled to the ground, much like the old Bailey. She suffered at the hands of an imagined enemy that truly had no power over her, less the power she allowed it to have. Evie emerges, baptized by the rain, reborn in her real form, stronger, safer, and ready to rebel. V gives Evie a gift before he leaves to dispose of Creedy. 
he gives her the choice to live in this world where people fear their government or to live in the new one where government fears their people. Evie has never had a choice like this. She has been conditioned to not make choices her entire life. If not for the horrific farce V put her through, she may not have had the courage to pull that lever and send the train. What V did to Evie may have been evil, but it may also have been a necessary evil. It gives her the courage to say no. The big difference between the no she cries out when being attacked by the Fingermen and the no she plainly whispers in the tunnel when confronted by Finch, in both instances, a man with a gun was in her space. The first time she needed help. This time, she helps the man with the gun. Evie holds her ground and changes the world. But Evie is not the hero of this story. I was born in Nottingham in 1985. I don't remember much of those early years, but I do remember the rain. Banished from her home for being herself, Valerie ventures into the world alone with only her hope to hold on to. She meets another woman and they live together, sharing a life of romance and celebration, an unwilling sacrifice that led to rebirth and a change for the greater good. Without Valerie, there would be no V. He would have given up. It was through her selfless act of declaring love for someone she did not know and maybe in other surroundings would not even want to know that saved him. She did the most generous thing that anyone can do and that is to love completely without complete understanding. Valerie sets a standard in the face of relentless torture and that is followed by both V and Evie when they are at their lowest. Valerie declares her personhood. She does what Roy Batty does at the end of Blade Runner. She does what all living, sentient souls do when the end is near. She makes a leap of faith and reaches out, heroically. Valerie is the hero of V for Vendetta. Without her, nothing else would happen. I love you. With all my heart, I love you. Valerie. I pose a query to my audience, some parameters as preface. We can all agree that V is insane. He's mad, he has done terrible things, murdered people in their beds, he's killed police officers and public officials. V is not right in the head, either through circumstance or nature or both. He faked an abduction, he tricked Evie, he tortured her, he created chaos in the streets and indirectly got children killed. Do the ends justify the means when it comes to V's mission? He knew he would not survive the fight with Creedy's henchmen. He placed trust on Evie to do the right thing. They make the choice that their hero could not. Purists of the book have said that the movie misses the point that Alan Moore laid out in the graphic novel, and to an extent, they're right. The book has multiple layers and storylines that are simply absent from the movie, but like the translation of Starship Troopers from book to screen, I think the movie is its own thing, a send-up of the book more than an adaptation. The best satire gets better with age. Robocop, for example, is a haunting movie 30 years later. V for Vendetta was a warning telling us to not grow complacent or apathetic. It illuminates how fragile the freedom of a people can be and to not get distracted too long because dissent is waiting in the wings. Vigilance, my excellent friends. That is the price we must continually pay.